The people who live and work in Outback Australia can be confident of help and support when it's needed, even though the distances are vast. However, life there wasn't always like that. Right up to the beginning of the 20th century, the people of the Outback were literally on their own, and life was a daily struggle. The story of how a mantle of safety was created for them is one of the great tales of modern Australian history. John Flynn was born in 1880 in Maligal in Victoria and he became a school teacher after he left school at the age of 18. A few years later, he began his theological studies in Melbourne and joined the Christian ministry. He was 30 before he graduated in divinity. Flynn became interested in working with the people of inland Australia. In his graduation year, he wrote a handbook called The Bushman's Companion, which contained hints for outbackers. It included useful tips like first aid, how to make a will, a selection of hymns and prayers, and an order of service. I think John Flynn was an extraordinary character. Uh, he was somebody who loved people, uh, loved the bush, uh, had a deep faith uh, in God, obviously, and was, was driven by that sense of, of God's calling on his life uh, to give of himself. He was an extraordinarily selfless person. At the end of 1910, Flynn accepted a two-year placement at the Smith of Dunesk Mission in Beltana, South Australia. It was the beginning of his dream to work in the outback. This particular mission had been established some years before by a Scottish benefactor, Mrs Henrietta Smith of Dunesk in Scotland, and it was pioneered by the Reverend Robert Mitchell. Mitchell spent some years working from Beltana, then handed over to the Reverend Frank Rowland. Rowland was appalled by the lack of medical facilities north of Port Augusta, and he started a campaign for a nurse and possibly the building of a hospital for the settlement. Sister E.A. Maine was appointed in 1907 as the pioneer nurse and was succeeded by Sister Latto Bett three years later. By 1911, the hospital had been built. In that same year, John Flynn was ordained a minister in the Presbyterian Church and was sent to Beltana. He began the work that would one day become folklore in the outback. Flynn continued to dream of ways in which the work of the church could be spread throughout the inland, and he kept in regular contact with the home mission about his ideas. In 1912, the Victorian Home Mission Committee and the Australian Board of Missions, who were in charge of Aboriginal welfare, decided that they needed a survey of conditions in the Northern Territory. The obvious man for the job was, of course, the Reverend John Flynn. He was given two commissions. The first one was to report on the Aborigines, and the second was to investigate the needs of the European settlers. Starting in Darwin, Flynn looked at the land and its resources, the people and their way of life, the hardships they faced, and their spiritual needs. He then wrote recommendations about the work that he thought needed to be undertaken across the continent. On the 26th of September 1912, Flynn presented his reports to the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. These reports were received with great enthusiasm and Flynn was appointed as the organising agent and superintendent of a special home mission area to address the needs of the settlers. The report on the needs of the Aboriginal people was referred to the overseas mission. John Flynn uh, had, a, had a nice saying that uh, he believed he was commissioned uh, to bring Christ to the people of inland Australia and to improve their conditions of life. And so that's, in a sense, what the commission to him was. But he saw it in much broader terms uh, in terms of meeting, seeking to meet all the needs of the people in the outback, not just their spiritual needs. It was a dream come true for the young minister, who set to work at once. Several months later, the project was given the title Australian Inland Mission. The Udnadatta Hostel and the work of Sister Latto Bett, already started by the Smith of Dunesk Mission, 
was transferred to the Australian Inland Mission. By the end of World War I, it further established nursing hostels at Port Hedland, Maranboy, and Halls Creek, and four patrols. Two of those patrols remained on active service throughout the war. Flynn was still working on his mantle of safety for inland Australia, and he knew that air transport was the way of the future. He'd received a long and detailed letter from Lieutenant Clifford Peel, a young medical student who was passionate about flying. Peel wanted to encourage Flynn to create an aerial medical service for the outback. Sadly, Peel was on his way to the war when he wrote that letter. Not long afterwards, he was shot down and killed at the age of 24. Inspired by Clifford Peel's dream, John Flynn campaigned for a decade for an aerial service. Finally, a long-time supporter, Hugh Victor Mackay, left a bequest for an aerial experiment. At the same time, Flynn met the legendary Hudson Fish, a founder of Qantas. With money in hand, in 1928, they set up an aerial ambulance service based in Cloncurry in Queensland. Presbyterian Church said to John Flynn, if you can raise another £5,000, then we'll have £7,000 to uh, have a, an experimental effort uh, for an aerial uh, medical service. So John Flynn and one of his uh, staff members, um, uh, the, the Reverend uh, Andrew Barber, set to work to raise this £5,000. They got to 4500 and the last 500 pounds, Flynn and Barber had a, had a conversation and said, how about we personally guarantee the last 500 pounds? So they agreed. But Andrew Barber said afterwards, that was all right for John Flynn. He didn't have 500 pounds to rub together. <laughs> During the period that Flynn was campaigning for the aerial medical service, he was also looking for ways of providing better communication for the outback. He'd already approached a World War I veteran named George Towns about wireless technology, and they'd begun experimenting in 1925 with the new equipment. It had potential, so Flynn asked Alfred Traeger to join them as a field radio engineer. Within a year, they'd established a radio signal between Alice Springs and Hermansburg, 130 kilometres apart. Traeger had refined the equipment by developing a compact generator to power the transceiver but it still needed two people to operate it. By 1927, his further refinements produced a generator powered by pedalling, which allowed single operators to generate power with their feet. Later, he added a keyboard, which made the use of Morse code redundant. In 1929, the first single pedal wireless was installed at Augustus Downs near Cloncurry in Queensland. By now, the aerial medical service and the pedal radio were saving countless lives. The church believed that the flying medical staff and the network of radios needed to stand alone. In 1939, the aerial medical service was officially transferred from the Presbyterian Church to a separate organisation. It became known as the Flying Doctor Service of Australia and later the Royal Flying Doctor Service. During this period, the work of the Methodist Church in Outback Australia had begun to expand, and in 1926 the Federal Methodist Inland Mission was formed. The Reverend Colonel A.T. Holden was appointed as the first superintendent, followed by the Reverend T.C. Rental, and then by the Reverend Harry Griffiths. John Flynn continued to establish a number of new services and patrols, and in 1939 he was elected Moderator General of the Presbyterian Church. By the time World War II began, the Australian Inland Mission and the Methodist Inland Mission were working closely together. The decision to uh, cooperate between the Presbyterian Methodist congregational work was, was taken very readily by John Flynn and his counterparts in the other two churches. Uh, the Reverend A.T. Holden and Harry Griffiths in the Methodist Church and their counterparts in the Congregational Church, particularly in the Northern Territory and particularly focusing on Darwin and then Alice Springs. 
uh, but also divvying up some of the uh, regions of Australia and say, so, well, you send a patrol a minister or patrol padre there, we'll send a padre over here. And so right from the beginning of that work, the sense of cooperation between these Protestant churches uh, was very, very helpful. They formed a partnership to provide a recreational club for military and civilian men assigned to Darwin. They also invited the Congregational Church to share in some of that ministry work, and the doors of the club opened in 1940 at the height of the war. It was in 1949 that Flynn began his last project, the old-timers settlement in Alice Springs. Two years later, he died from cancer. Flynn's ashes were scattered at the base of Mount Gillen near Alice Springs, and in 1953, a memorial was erected at the site. Interestingly, disquiet that the rock on Flynn's grave in Arunta country had been taken from the Kalu Kalu site, known as the Devil's Marbles, resulted in a significant act of reconciliation. The rock was deeply sacred to the Kachechi Waramungu people, and in 1996 they formally requested that it be returned to its rightful place. In time, the Arunta people of the Alice Springs area offered a replacement rock, which was dedicated at the gravesite in 1999. In 1956, the John Flynn Memorial Church, the Cathedral of the Outback, was opened in Alice Springs. When they laid the foundation stone of the Flynn Memorial Church in Alice Springs, Bob Menzies, the uh, Prime Minister of the time, travelled all the way to Alice Springs. He was a good Presbyterian, mind you, Bob Menzies, but travelled to uh, Alice Springs to lay the foundation stone and to speak so highly of the enormous contribution that John Flynn uh, had made to the uh, nation of Australia. Around the same time, the Methodist, Presbyterian and Congregational churches in the Northern Territory became the United Church of Northern Australia. In 1977, a national union between the churches created the Uniting Church in Australia and the inland work of the churches combined to become Uniting Church Frontier Services. After Flynn's death, Reverend Fred Mackay, one of his patrol ministers, took over the job of superintendent. Mackay remained in that role until his retirement in 1974 when he handed over to Max Griffiths. In the same year, A.W. Pedrick was appointed the Federal Director of the Federal Methodist Inland Mission. He was succeeded in 1968 by Harry Mackay. In 1986, Gray Birch became the General Secretary of Frontier Services and was followed six years later by Brian Lewis Smith. As the needs of remote Australia have continued to grow, Frontier Services has found ways to provide the support and services needed by people in remote areas of the continent. Rosemary Young became National Director of Frontier Services in the year 2000. It is exciting to be celebrating 100 years of something that's been so important to the people of remote Australia. And it's very exciting to look to the future and to what's possible. It's and a source of enormous satisfaction to me, and I hope to my predecessors, that the organisation has continued to change to meet emerging needs over that 100 years, and I expect that we'll continue to do that into the future. That's why we're relevant today. And I think as we focus on partnerships, on resourcing and sustaining the skills and the confidence in communities that will allow them to provide their own services into the future, so slightly changing the focus from being the service deliverer to being the facilitator, the enabler of those services being provided by people themselves, we've got that wonderful role of partnership ahead of us and something that in time we'll all be able to look at with total pride. John Flynn pioneered the work of the Australian Inland Mission. For 100 years it has allowed the people and communities of remote Australia to put down roots and even prosper because of the mantle of safety he created. Frontier Services acknowledges and celebrates the hope, the spirit and the resilience of the people of remote Australia. It continues to be privileged to stand beside them into the future.